Okay, we're ready to get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining the CQC team for today's webinar, Caring for Patients Virtually, Lessons from a Successful Virtual Primary Care Practice. We're delighted all of you here are to join us today. And as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be available to you one to two days after the webinar is complete. We are sharing a PDF of the slides now, and if you would like to follow along. However, these slides um, the recording, as well as the URLs mentioned, uh, will be sent via email to the registrants. Before we get started, let's review a few Zoom tips. All attendees are muted upon entry to ensure no background noise is coming through. If you're joining us via phone, please refrain from using the whole button as we don't want as we want to eliminate any background music. If you'd like to speak during the Q and A session, or if you have any question during the presentation. Please let Michael Au know through the chat and he will provide you instructions when to unmute yourself. Also, if you have any questions or comments at any point, utilize the chat box. Zoom is currently experiencing overload and uh, to reduce any bandwidth uh, issues, we would like to kindly ask participants to please do not use the uh, video feature. Although we will share uh, links via the chat, uh, due to Zoom new security settings, you will have to copy and paste them into your browser of choice. After this meeting has ended, you may receive a prompt from Zoom asking the meeting uh, experience. The feedback being gathered is in regards to your experience from Zoom and not the content of the meeting. And finally, if you have any technical issues with your audio or video, please direct your message to me, Jose Ordonez, and I will do my best to assist you. Before we get started, um, we, I definitely want to let you know a few tips in how to mute and you mute yourself. If you join through a computer, uh, definitely you will see a microphone right here and you just have to clean this microphone in the toolbar at the bottom uh, to mute and mute yourself. And if you have joined through a phone, you just have to click the phone icon in the toolbar or simply press star six. And through the webinar, we'll be also having a couple of polls. So make sure to select your answer, click the submit button, and the pop-up window will disappear. That's how you will know that you have uh, answered this poll. And at this point, can I have everyone um, please chat your name and the organization that you belong to in the chat box, please. Welcome everyone. Definitely see some familiar faces or names. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As people finishing on that, we'll slowly move to the next slide. And here we're gonna get started with our first polls. We definitely wanna hear from you. Where are you dialing from? And also the type of organization uh, that you're part of. So let me launch a poll. Okay, I see there's a lot of People so far joining us from the Los Angeles area, Southern California. We'll give you a couple more seconds to finish this poll. Make sure to submit, uh, to click the submit button so your answer is recorded. Five more seconds. Okay. 
you know, share the results. And we definitely see that there's a lot of people, especially from the Los Angeles area, and then well, a lot of uh, providers and uh, IPA mostly as well too. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Lastly, the California Quality Collaborative has developed this COVID-19 resource page, which includes resources for providers like billing, the uh, implementation of telehealth and documentation. This is updated weekly. Uh, so please uh, click this link when you have a chance. Um, at this moment, I would like to hand the virtual stage to April Watson. Thanks so much, Jose. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Thanks. So welcome everyone. Um, to this webinar about virtual care and um, really excited in a moment to introduce our guests. Um, we have a large group today, which is really exciting. And as Jose said, my name's April Watson. I'm the Senior Director of CQC. Um, so I just wanted to very briefly, I'm not gonna read what's on the slide here, but since we have such a large group, there are a few folks who may, might not be familiar with uh, California Quality Collaborative. Um, and our role today is really as a kind of convener and identifier of best practices. So um, if there's questions that follow up that none of us have the answer or that come up that none of us have the answer to, we'll be sure to circle back and get those answers for you. Um, and our desire is really to just provide valuable information um, in responding to the, to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So next slide, Jose, I'm gonna just, um, uh, briefly go through the objectives for this webinar. So um, today you will have really gained an understanding of Tara's virtual practice. Um, you're going to hear some lessons learned and best practices for virtual care from the Tara team. Uh, learn how to support high-risk patients uh, who receive chronic care management care um, as well. And then we are going to have a chunk of time for questions and answers. Um, and most of you have submitted some questions in advance as well. So uh, we'll have a lot of great content uh, today. And we're really excited to, to jump into that. So next slide, before I introduce the guests, um, we're gonna start with an anchor question, which is really meant to kind of get us in the mind frame of uh, what we're gonna be covering over the next hour or so. Um, and so that question that we wanna invite you to reflect on is what's your biggest fear when implementing telehealth. Um, so take a moment and reflect on that. You can chat your answers into the chat box. Um, you could certainly unmute yourself and we'd love to hear your voices in response to this. I'm gonna be silent for a minute or so and just let folks think about this and uh, reflect on what your biggest fears might be when implementing telehealth. So please go ahead and think about that and, and offer up your thoughts on that question. Getting a lot of responses here, so I'll start reading some of these off. Um, Thanks, Michael. So it's privacy, uh, it's a big one that we've been hearing. Missing critical diagnoses. Uh, something will be missed. Uh, yes, it's <laughs> huge concern. Um, as an IPA, will there be wide adoption in physician practices? Uh, missing physical signs and symptoms when doing telehealth visits level of documentation, how much should be, how much should we be documenting? Not being able to examine patients, missing things like new onset AF, for instance. Patients and care partners do not have access to internet, limited data plans. Uh, which visits are appropriate? Mm -hmm. Missing a critical medical problem. Um, Another one here for documentation and billing. Now, thank you for all these. Yeah, I saw a couple too as well. Thanks, Michael, about um, kind of compensation and payment models and you know, uh, will things revert back after the crisis? So I think questions that we're all asking as well. So please feel free to continue to chat in your responses. Um, we'll go to the next slide because I want to just get to introductions and, um, and really jump into the content. So 
Um, I'm really thrilled and grateful that we have the Terra practice joining us today. Um, just really, really pleased that they are able to take the time and share their expertise with us. So I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Yumi Taylor, and she's a primary care, a practicing primary care doc and founding physician for Terra, uh, which we'll be hearing more about. Um, and she leads the practice design, data and technology integration and payer relationships. Um, she's got over 10 years of experience in the primary care innovation delivery space, doing quality improvement work team-based care and alternative payment model adoption. And then we also have Lynette Fung, and Lynette is a director on the Sutter Health Design and Innovation Team. Um, and she has over 10 years of experience in healthcare and is part of the founding team for Terra. And then finally, Rob Scrace is Terra's practice manager. He's responsible for maintaining the smooth operations and quality while growing the practice to scale. And before Tara, he spent 12 years working in healthcare innovation related to EHR implementation. Um, so I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Taylor, um, who will take it from here. All right, great, thank you, April. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I see there's a great participation, so it's um, exciting to be here um, sharing with you today. I hope everyone is managing with the drastic change to your daily lives and finding a new stride in your practice, perhaps um, incorporating some virtual care now. Um, thank you for sharing your fears implementing telehealth. I think I saw some themes around uncertainty, um, how things will change after COVID, but also just, um, you know, a sense of unease of, of providing care virtually and making sure that you provide high quality care. So um, I hope that, um, you know, we're going to share, I'm going to share today um, our journey providing virtual first primary care. And I hope that the information shared today makes your transition feel a little easier and less alone. So to start, I want to give a high level overview of Tara. So we are a virtual first full service primary care model. We started in 2018. So virtual first, we're not virtual only. We do see patients in person, but we do establish relationships, initial relationships with patients virtually. We found that we've been able to deliver 95% of our care virtually. So through secure messaging through the patient portal, telephone, video, and then when we need in-person visits. We manage chronic conditions use, utilizing a health coach, uh, health coaching. We also do um, heavy panel management, specifically utilization management and closing care gaps, uh, particularly using frontline developed data reports. And then as well, we've had a heavy focus on mental health integration and making that virtual, virtual access for patients, particularly talk therapy. We are value-based and all of our population is currently in an alternative payment model, which has given us flexibility to, uh, to explore virtual outreach to patients and care. Our true north is a quadruple aim, so providing, um, uh, managing total costs of care, providing high quality care, great patient experience, and then as well, very important provider experience, making sure um, it's an enjoyable uh, environment for the care team. We do take a care team approach. So we're sort of like a patient-centered medical home light in that our care team consists of a physician with one-to-one -one ratio with a registered dietitian, an LVN, and an APC, which is a, a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner. Of note, I wanna highlight this past year, we are recognized for having the highest quality of care across the Sutter network here in Northern California. Um, and um, our patients are located around Northern California because we do have a virtual footprint. We have patients in multiple different counties. As well, we're growing, so we're, we're hiring physicians and, and building out our, um, our, our pods. So we'll be continuing to spread across Northern California. And then in terms of our technology, so we currently utilize Sutter's um, uh, Epic, which is their EHR. And integrated with their EHR is video. That's the video platform um, that, uh, that Epic uses. And so um, patients access that through the patient portal, but that's all integrated currently with, within Epic. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about our demographics, very common question I get. So because we're located and started in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, oftentimes get, so your patients are young, tech savvy, healthy, you know, engineers at Google, Apple, Facebook. And actually that is a myth. Um, 
we, our population actually in our HMO population, they are city workers, they're school district employees, they're service industry employees. A lot of them have come off of Medi-Cal um, and are currently employed and so have insurance, this HMO um, health insurance. And then as well, we also have seniors um, age 65 and older that have been part of our panel. So that's um, what we've learned doing virtual practice is in this population. Next slide. So uh, demographics, our average age is 49. The oldest patient um, in my panel currently is 98. And most of our population is uh, white and Asian, though we also have um, a Latino and African-American mixed race that are also part of our population. A quarter of the population does have financial insecurity, so it's challenging to pay for basics like food and housing and medical care. In terms of education, 40% do report that they have uh, the highest level of education is some college or less. And then in this NIH question, in terms of how they rate their health, 16% do self-report fair or poor. Next slide. A common question I get, and I saw this in the pre-question pre, um, feed, was um, what is the patient experience like? What's the acceptance of a virtual, of virtual relationship with primary care? I think we know it for urgent care um, with the teledoc and doc on demand, but specifically for primary care where we're looking to develop longitudinal relationship, what's that acceptance like? And over the last couple of years, we've learned that patients that we've had really high satisfaction um, with the visits, and not just in patients who are early adopters. And as I said, these are not tech savvy patients, um, you know, engineers by background, um, but there are a range of patients. And we've, you know, particularly been reaching out into sort of these early majority, late majority. So um, I love this curve. This curve sort of, sh you know, shows the diffusion of innovation. So um, again, you know, our focus has been in providing primary care to a range uh, of patients. So I do want to acknowledge that we have also learned that a virtual first approach, there are patients we've come across that do prefer a traditional practice. And so, you know, not, not a good fit for Tara, but there have been plenty of patients that have um, experienced Tara and been open to the model. I think this quote sort of summarizes someone who falls into that early, late majority. So she's a 55-year-old Tara patient who said, that admittedly I was skeptical in the beginning. I wasn't crazy about doing a video chat, but I quickly got over that. And I really think that it is, it, that it is the way to be a great provider. And I think uh, what we've learned and what I hear from patients is it's access. They have more ready access to us. And so a, a big key is that it just facilitates that longitudinal relationship and um, ease of access to their care team. All right, next slide. So I wanted to show you just a little bit, I'll dive a little bit more into the details of the technology piece, since some of you may be living the, the pains of this now. Uh, so when I started in 2018, it was a very scary experience. I had practiced traditional primary care only prior to that. So doing virtual visits, I just didn't know what to expect. And so we started out in an exam room without windows. I had two screens sort of set up. I had a camera and I would have the electronic health record um, in the, the screen in the background. And then the video uh, was another floating screen in front. And over time, I learned that that was actually rather distracting to interact with, with patients that way. Uh, and so, uh, so moving into next slide into the uh, circa 2020, I found a much more comfortable way of when I'm doing video visits with patients, how to provide care. So in this uh, picture, you can see I'm comfortable on the bottom, professional up top. Uh, I have my setup now is in my, you know, um, home office. Um, Kid, when shelter in place, the kids upstairs running around. Uh, downstairs, I'm you know doing work, and I've got a laptop uh, set up, so that's where I'm looking at the EHR. And then I have a separate iPad, and I found the iPad is the best way, particularly so it's through Canto for those who have Epic. So video is um, integrated with Canto. I found that that's been the most seamless technology, uh, both for patients and provider. So I have the laptop set up. I use a stand. I can just adjust the angle. And then I turn the camera so that it is facing the edge of the laptop. And so I can um, have good eye contact with the patient 
through the camera, but also very easily see the, the EHR screen. And then on the patient's perspective, from their, from, from their perspective, they are joining through their My Health Online app, through their patient portal. So it's actually integrated with the schedule. They will see a green icon 15 minutes before the visit starts. And so they just open up their, their schedule and click on the app. And then again, it opens up the video um, and connects us. So um, that's a little bit of uh, kind of the setup in terms of how that, how um, Epic and uh, EHR has worked for us uh, at Terra. Next slide. All right, um, so I will, wondering if I should pause or just go ahead into lessons learned and then pause there. I think I'll, I see some, some chats coming in. Um, Michael, shall I just pause to take any questions in terms of setup? before I go into some of the key lessons learned? Uh, sure, yeah. uh, if you'd like to, um, so we got a question from Julianne Tomlin, maybe just a little bit of emphasis, um, but could you speak a little bit more about why this model and what drove the transition to this model? Sure, yes, I mean, I think um, we, why this model, uh, I would say one, one challenge for the system was improving access to primary care. So that was a large driver for developing this. As well, I think I mentioned we've been, we work in an alternative payment model. So we are out of fee for service that really allowed us to be able to innovate. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, and then maybe uh, just one more for now. Uh, so I'll just read this out. Um, so this provider is out on Epic also. Uh, they're hearing a lot of pushback from practices who state older patients don't know how to use their smartphones or that they don't have one. Um, how did you overcome this challenge? Oh, yes. I will talk about this in my lessons learned, but um, I will say it takes quite a bit of uh, support, technology support to get those patients. Um, first of all, the big barrier is downloading the My Help Online app to the smartphone. I think once that happens, and, and the second barrier is actually uh, logging into the app and then securing um, patients so they don't have to enter a password every time, but they can just, you know, use thumbprint or a four-digit passcode. Once those things are established, then it's, it's pretty seamless in terms of um, being able to do a video visit, but it does require quite a bit of um, technology support that our, our care team to date has supported patients in doing. And I'll talk some more about that in um, you know, a future slide. All right, great, great questions. Um, so first lesson, first thing that I've been um, pleasantly surprised by is that a lot of great high quality care and for high risk populations is, is amenable and manageable, and, manageable uh, and actually done well virtually. Um, so, one thing we've learned, and again, I keep coming back to access, but if you lower um, if you lower the barrier to access care and one of the care touch points is virtually, today I'm talking a lot about video, but a lot of our care we um, actually deliver through messaging with patients and through telephone. Those are predominant modes. Telephone, a, a smaller amount, but for the purposes of today, we're talking about telephone. I'll just say that's sort of interchangeable. Uh, when, you, when patients have more seamless access to primary care, they will present earlier with disease and that will present prevent um, downstream complications, ED visits and hospitalizations. So in that way, um, that virtual access is, is really critical. Um, I will say that, you know, currently, for example, I have a 53-year-old patient who is a new, new diagnosis of congestive heart failure. She's, um, she reached out to us last week with worsening shortness of breath. She'd gotten off her blood pressure medications. We've been trying to engage her for the last one year, and it's been working because she does reach out to us when she needs us. She reaches out to us by sending us a message, uh, and we do her care all through telephone calls. And so I'll say that um, I have a 100% virtual relationship with her. I've not met with her in person, but have really good rapport with her and have finally um, you know, um, engaged her to uh, 
go the next step and get her first, you know, transthoracic echo to get a workup, which she did. And she's got an ejection fraction of 30%. So she's got this new um, um, cardiomyopathy. And that now she's open to going to cardiology and getting a catheterization. And, and so, again, a lot of care that um, otherwise she would have fallen through the cracks if she needed to come in um, for in-person visits. She works two jobs. She doesn't have the time to take off of work when she, she just needs to be able to call when she needs us when it's, you know, it's on her, her, um, her schedule, her timeline. So that's just a little example of, or that's one example of, of again, um, really high quality care that happens through, um, uh, through, through virtual and making your, making care really highly accessible for patients. All right, next slide. So lesson number two, uh, technology adoption. So we've found that patients will adopt technology when they understand the value. It is hard to endorse a piece of technology, whether it's a blood pressure cuff or, or uh, video visits, if they don't understand what the value proposition is for them. But oftentimes when there's an acute issue that needs to be addressed, that's a great time to sort of go through the steps to get them onboarded to do the video visit. And so, uh, one thing we've learned is that it is it does uh, you do need to build an extra time for when the technology uh, to to support patients to get on to technology. So some of the video that videos that are out there don't require downloading an app. What we've been using it requires downloading uh, you know My Health Online, the pa a patient portal, and ultimately an app onto the smartphone for patients to be able to interact with us by video. So again, staff will need to support that. The other thing that I found is that um, it is not more time efficient for physician time to do video visits. So I have found that, again, a lot of care really happens through that conversation. And so you're not short circuiting those conversations when you're doing a video visit with patients. It's sort of the same thing like, you know, when they're coming in in person. Now, again, certainly patients not having to travel in person is, is more uh, uh, time e efficient for them. Um, and then uh, yes. So, so again, I think um, when there are, and there are other examples that, that I would have, but again, I, you know, adopting other technologies, you know, even thinking about connected devices where there's more cost associated with that. If there's a clear use case and value proposition for the patient, you'll find that they are far more motivated to do that, but just be prepared that it will take your care team's time to help support in some of those technology um, or just in troubleshooting some of the technology adoption. Great, next slide. All right, and then the third piece is we found that 90%, 98% of care is around a good history. And actually we don't need the video component, it is that audio component. Um, now that being said, where video adds a lot of value is from the musculoskeletal exam. I saw questions about that. So in particular, I, I've found that I've done the musculoskeletal exam differently over video than I had ever done in person tr in traditional care. Particularly, I found it's a great way to um, sort of triage next steps. So imagine if you have someone who has a knee complaint, a lot of the times that may be um, osteoarthritis and you sort of need conservative management. And so I can gauge, you know, uh, about the knee. I'll have them do weight bearing exercises and functional assessments um, may have them watch them squat you know watch them um, uh, bear weight on that knee to understand again um, kind of kind of next steps and whether they need it you know an in-person evaluation or again just conservative measures and, and follow-up uh, the other value um, proposition for the video piece is um, assessing the home environment so I have a patient who's quadriplegic and and a very difficult, hard, cardiopedic, bariatric patient, very difficult for him to leave the home. The initial visit I did establishing a relationship with him and his wife, who's a caregiver, was to see what his, um, his home setup, his bedroom setup was. And actually in that conversation, we recognized he needed a new Hoyer lift. So it was helpful to actually be able to physically see um, that need. And then finally, video, I think does work well to establish for an initial visit to establish rapport. So just like in person, you get to see each other. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, and then going from there, oftentimes for us at Terra, we then transition the relationship to happen by telephone. Um, after that initial video visit. 
And then finally, I want to say a word about skin exams, dermatologic. So with our particular, with video, the image quality is not, it's not a high pixel quality. So I found it's very difficult to assess um, the skin through video. So we've developed a different workflow. So again, using different platforms, you may or may not be able to do a skin exam by video. We've had to move to still images for that piece. All right, next uh, slide. And then a few video realities. So things that we've found. So I think it's really important when the video isn't working, particularly what happens, what we run into is if a patient can't connect to the video, if, um, and we've spent already five minutes into the visit sort of troubleshooting it, I'll jump to telephone. Same thing, video started, we can see each other, but then, you know, the screen freezes or the audio quality is poor. We'll just, you know, time's sake, just uh, switch over to a telephone. It works fine. And, you know, again, our feedback, patient feedback is, um, you, know, you know, high, high quality there. You know, patients are assessing, could they get their need addressed? And, um, you know, was, was there discussion, you know, did it meet their expectations? So I just say, you know, go ahead and complete the visit when your video isn't working, that's worked really well for us. Next is confirming location. So for us in California and our organization after COVID, we'll need to confirm that patients, it's not, not only um, they need to physically do the video visit in California. So um, just confirming where they're doing the video visit location. Also some safety and privacy issues. So I've had some patients that are, they jump on the video and I realize they are driving, they're, they're multitasking and they're driving, you know, on the highway. So again, asking them to pull over to do, um, to do the, the just, you know, discussion safely. And then privacy, a lot of patients do it doing video from work. They may be out sitting out in the hallway. So if you're going into a more sensitive topic, just remembering to ask, hey, are you in a, a safe private place to have this conversation? And then finally, having clear communication with patients when to seek in-person care. So just the other day, I saw a patient who um, was having um, some shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, she had access to vitals, her blood pressure and heart rate were fine. Somewhere in the back of my mind, very lower suspicion for PE, but again, I made it very clear to her um, what the, the steps were and that over the weekend, if, if that plur plur pleuritic chest pain was getting worse, that she would need to present to the ED because we would want to rule out a PE. So again, just helping patients understand when they need to come in and what the next escalation of care is. All right, next slide. Great, so before I go into this next section, I will pause and take a few questions on that section. Um, yes, thank you everyone. We, we are getting a lot of questions. Um, just a reminder, uh, if we can't get your questions, uh, even after the Q&A, we, we will be sending follow-up materials um, to answer those. Um, so this first one from Latonya King, um, in reference to lesson one, uh, when you were just speaking now, what, are, what were the two dominant modes uh, okay, sorry, could you ask that question again? What's the question? Um, and maybe if Watani, you'd like to unmute yourself, but uh, she was asking what were the two dominant modes um, in reference to lesson one of building Terra? The two dominant modes. Yeah, I think it was telephone and video. I, you said that you, you mentioned that some of the, the two dominant modes that you all were using, and I think you said telephone, and then I'm assuming the next one was video. I was just wondering, you know, if you had to um, yeah. determine like how much telephone, video, and messaging, which one do you use more or find more effective? Gotcha. So I'd actually say that the majority of care happens through messaging, secure messaging through the patient portal and telephone and then much smaller percentage for, you know, particularly once the relationship established through video. I did see a question there about sort of urgent care visits and, and things like that, acute complaints. Again, a lot of that we're able to, uh, we're able to address triage and close through messaging and a telephone call. Um, we have another question here from Cheryl Marks. Uh, what type of productivity goals do you set each day and do you differ between primary and specialty? Great. So I heard a question about productivity. So clinicians in our practice are not um, in an RVU um, model. So we are not, we are not, um, our, we're, our um, 
uh, care teams are are a um, compensated based on salaried, um, but then compensation based on our our uh, quadruple A, the true north. So outcomes on utilization, quality of care, patient experience. Hope that answers the question. Um, so another, our, our oh. day is structured very differently. We're not doing visits back to back to back. It's that that's not the sort of the purpose of the model. Okay. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, question from Libby, which was answered by Robert, but um, if you'd like to maybe uh, emphasize anything anymore, how do your health coaches support this model um, virtually? Yes, great. Yes, yeah, so the health coach, um, we've sort of found the sweet spot is to have a registered dietitian in that role. A lot of the questions are around, or the, the area of expertise is in nutrition support. Um, so again, all coaching does do, you know, does provide motivational interviewing. It does address things, you know, outside of dietary support. Um, but, you know, sleep, stress, um, exercise, um, setting goals and a, a care plan. So um, coaches will meet with patients from, uh, from a weekly to bi-weekly basis to do very close follow-up. We target specifically patients that are higher or rising risk for those coaching sessions. And maybe we'll do one more for now. Um, this one was answered as well, but um, it, it could bear repeating. Do you employ any remote monitoring tools such as Google Media Scales, uh, blood pressure cuffs? If so, how did you choose which devices to use? Right. Yep. I saw. Thank you, Rob. I saw that um, that uh, you've taken this to you know, a question on the chat. Um, we are. We've moved our way into remote monitoring. We're not heavy in that. I will say for a couple of reasons. I think um, the connected devices. So we've had a lot of success with patients who will you know purchase a blood pressure cuff, we'll just say that's probably the most common, and then glucometer. And we found that it's been enough to kind of close the care gaps just for them to self-report those um, values through mess secure, a secure message. Um, that being said, we are, are moving into uh, piloting and, and working at the system level, they're trying to integrate with HealthKit so that you can have connected device information coming in as well. We're moving into a pilot that's looking at continuous glucose monitoring and pairing that with coaching um, as well as we're looking at sleep monitoring as well to, to manage patients with chronic pain um, and uh, mental health as a, as a vital sign to track um, progress in those, in those um, and those health conditions. Okay, great questions. All right. Um, all right, let's see how we're doing on time. Great. So um, great. Well, those are great questions. We'll take some more. I'm going to move into just talking about lessons learned in managing high risk or rising risk populations. So, you know, I, our practice is not, you know, we're not treating coughs and colds day in and day out. We are managing a lot of substantial um, complexities of care, everything from um, new, um, new diagnoses of cancer to patients who have social and behavioral risks, including um, um, concerns with financial resources and health literacy, chronic pain, um, and stage renal disease on dialysis. Mental health is a big com comorbidity that we do see. Um, so along those lines, um, next slide. Um, one thing we've learned is, you know, and again, this is really why we've taken a team-based approach is that um, it, it, it takes a team to, to manage these patients. And our, where our needs have become and where COVID has helped is that those teams have now become more virtual for us, which has been really helpful to increase access for patients. So again, um, virtual access to specialty care now has been a big win um, for, for patients. Otherwise, that might their care might get delayed, but really we just need that consultative piece. Uh, as well, we work with the system. It's an, we work in an integrated delivery system, so we have those partnerships for wraparound services, so home health, palliative care, hospice services. So it's really great to be virtual and to have then someone in home, um, a, a licensed professional that's in home that's helping to support those patients um, there. And then mental health, I think I mentioned before, is a, a really big piece. And again, working um, to have multiple options for our patients to be able to have access to talk therapy virtually. All right, next slide. Um, all right. Next lesson is it's really important to think about your caregivers and to really engage them 
again, virtually, some of these caregivers don't live with the, with the you know their loved one, um, and so again, it's 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 helpful. And I, I know there might be some billing limitations, but a lot of a lot of our care, particularly for um, our patients that um, primarily have a caregiver supporting them, the visits are really happening with the caregivers. And so there's a few few things to take into consideration, and one of them for us has been proxy access. So you want the caregivers to be able to have you if you're messaging messaging with the patients for them to have proxy access to their to their medical records um, is a really sort of seamless way to do that. Again, and then I also want to mention assisted living. So we've also worked with the assisted living staff. And so we've had virtual visits, uh, both telephone and video, where the staff is supporting, um, technologically supporting that visit happening with the patient. All right, next slide. And then finally, we've learned that you just need to be um, creative and flexible when you're utilizing these um, virtual tools. So I want to give an example. One of the things we started to institute is a virtual pill count for controlled substances. Um, so again, for patients that are on um, high risk medications, we can do it's you know part of our contract, you know, um, narcotic um, or controlled substance contract that uh, once or twice a year, we will, um, the nurse will call them, you know, they'll have their, they'll, we'll count their pills, we'll look at the number on their pills to make sure it matches. So again, a way to sort of use video as a, a, a way to um, make sure, um, you know, care is safe. Um, and then The other thing is remote patient monitoring. I think, um, you know, we don't talk a lot about that. We're sort of really kind of just our care teams really branching into that. But again, I think um, you can, there is, I think the billing realities. Um, so there's, a, you know, CMS is, is definitely paying more for um, remote patient monitoring. I will say for us, uh, who we haven't had to um, look, at, you know, go after those billing points. It's been enough for us to sort of um, use the existing, you know, blood pressure cuffs and scales and, um, you know, peak flows that patient has it has at home and have them self-report that. Um, so again, you know, at the end of the day, just um, to provide high quality care, it's, you know, just figuring out what is sort of what lowers the barrier for patients to be able to um, report their, their health concerns or, and report their data to you at home. All right. All right. And then, um, all right, next slide. Great. I'm going to go into some audience questions. These are questions that came in um, previously. So I just wanted to speak to them. So one of the questions was, how do you reach patients without reliable internet access? Again, if um, you can't do video visit, we would do telephone calls. And I have not yet come across a patient that didn't have access to telephone. Um, and um, I will say even, I think there's a question, we've even had one homeless patient who could get access um, to, to do video visits with us and it did happen through the shelter and again through a caregiver or a person, one of the workers there who was willing to sort of provide that caregiving service for this patient. So again, I think that's a little bit of being creative and flexible with your, with existing resources to kind of, um, you know, reach patients and provide care. Where do patients take their visits? So work, home, store. I had an 88-year-old woman who was, her first visit with me, she was grocery shopping and in the checkout line doing her visit. So um, you'll see some creative, um, some creative choices that patients make to do their visit with you. Um, and you can also have some very frank conversations with them when they're in their home setting or their car, some very frank conversations. Um, um, that, uh, again, happens, I think, when patients are in their element and comfortable. Uh, vitals, so again, for BMI, blood pressure, um, we do document this. Uh, I have a question there, but um, we're, we're looking into the details about Medicare, and again, we don't talk so much about billing. You guys will have a, 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 a sort of a specialist that will talk about it, but currently we do document those vitals as self-reported and submit them. Uh, chronic maintenance for diabetes, hypertension. Again, we're doing, we do standing labs for patients, coaching, 
And then on the back end, we're tracking patients to make sure those things are happening. So a lot of our patients, particularly if they're, they have chronic disease and they're stable, they're kind of on autopilot. It's when they're unstable or uncontrolled, we do very heavy outreach to them and utilize virtual tools to um, engage them. Again, the focus is all about engaging these patients to, um, for those behavior changes. How do you risk stratify patients? We do, we do have uh, an intake tool that helps us stratify patients so we can see across our panel our higher risk patients. So we manage them more like case management that way. In terms of uh, for your purposes in scheduling video visits, I do think it's really helpful to have those patients triaged prior so that you know, the provider's practicing at top of licensure and you're, sort of, you're figuring out which patients are appropriate um, for, um, you know, for a video visit um, versus another type of visit perhaps maybe in person. All right, next slide. And then uh, of note, so CMS does recognize the G-code for the annual wellness visit. This is really new. We hadn't been doing this. So for, I will say the annual wellness visit we had identified is a great opportunity to do that virtually. It's really, it's all screening and it's a great opportunity to, uh, to do the risk stratification, the risk adjustment. Um, so again, um, the, the G code is now recognized um, virtually through, and it has to be, it does have to be video, can't be telephone. So it has to have the visual component. How do you conduct an orthopedic musculoskeletal exam? We talked a, a bit about that. Again, done really well over a video visit um, to observe function um, and to really help triage a lot, probably maybe 80% of the time conservative management's appropriate. Maybe 20% of the time they need to come in for the in-person. How do you do effective outreach to seniors and elderly? I talked about um, caregivers playing a very critical role. And then again, I, I didn't mention this as much, but really explaining the, how the process works. So this is new for patients. It's, it's, the, it's the analogy that people get when, you know, they've, um, you know, the horse and buggy and never having experienced a car or the Xerox machine. We found it's just taken a lot of um, education around the model, what virtual care is, that it's not less, it's, you know, they're not getting anything less that, you know, and that they have the option, you know, when they need higher level of care for that to occur. And then how do you incorporate pharmacists? Um, we don't currently in our model, except for the system has pharmacists that are managing Coumadin, for example, um, and then some of them will periodically do chart reviews for higher risk medications. Um, but perhaps, you know, as we get larger, there may be a role for coaching. And then um, does, do we provide urgent care? Yes, actually most of our, you know, we have kind of patients with chronic disease on autopilot and then really patients that are reaching, in, reaching to us for urgent care needs. That's um, the way our model works. So, all right, I will um, pause there for, Oh yeah, one more thing. Yes, open it up for questions. So yes, I just wanted to share a provider testimonial, hopefully some encouragement for you guys going through this transition. So this is from a provider in our, in our system, uh, in a department that we've worked closely with. She's, you know, um, in her 50s and she's been practicing in traditional primary care. She sent me a text message the other day um, because I've kind of been following um, her her uh, adoption of televideo. And she had to say, uh, surprised, because um, I probably consider her um, maybe a late adopter. She said, I love working from home. I think I want to quit her current job and just be a telehealth doc. So it's like doing home visits from home. So, all right. Well, thank you. All right, we're going to open it up now for some questions and dialogue. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you, Yumi. I mean, we've gotten a ton of questions coming through the chat. Um, and Rob and Lynette, I want to thank you for jumping in and answering some of those um, as well. But Michael, I'm going to ask you, um, I think you've been doing some triaging for us and, and maybe to tee up some questions that, um, you know, that have come through that we maybe don't have answers to um, in the chat. And then also, I just want to invite others, please, you know, chat in your questions. Um, or if you'd like to ask a question, we would love to hear your voice. And maybe just type in your name in the, in the chat box. And then um, Michael can kind of create a queue for, for people to, to ask questions. But Michael, um, why don't you get us started with one of the questions? Sure. Yeah. No, um, thank you, Annette and Rob. You've done a great job of answering a lot of these questions, actually. Uh, but one just came in from uh, Lloyd. Uh, and was actually answered by Hunter Gatewood, but um, would also love your perspective as well. 
Since IHA doesn't accept self-reported blood pressure readings, how do you ensure that your quality scores don't suffer? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so we're working on some clarification whether um, self-reported blood pressures will count um, for P4P. We're expecting an answer, um, but I will say um, in the current state, you know, we, you know, will, so we have we have other places, uh, we work with retail clinics, so they're open seven days a week, 12 hours a day. So we do utilize that as a place that patients can come in person and have vitals checked by a medical assistant. And then that, that is part of our EPIC system, so it's all integrated. So that's sort of our workaround to the self-reporting. And for patients that it's otherwise difficult for them to come into the office during standard office hours. And I think I'll just call out, I think actually Hunter's, um, thank you Hunter for the contribution in chat. His, his contribution was actually related to Wi-Fi access and privacy and that a solution that some sites have used is to invite patients with cars to come to the parking lot and join the Wi-Fi from their, from their vehicle. Mm -hmm. So thanks for offering that, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that, yeah, sorry about that. Um, next question here from Ian. Uh, how much has your model been able to lower the total cost of care? <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, great question. So we ran data for over one year, one year's worth of data. So risk stratify, we show 35% total cost of care savings. This next one from Evan Polanski. Uh, we are planning to implement a virtual practice model and are beginning to do space planning with the building landlord. Uh, any tips that you have for them? Yep, sorry, say, so, can you ask that question again? Oh, sure. Uh, so Evan, uh, they're currently planning to implement a virtual practice model uh, and are starting to do some space planning. Um, do you have any tips for them? Got it, yeah, great, okay. Um, so if your providers um, are not going, if they're going to be doing video visits from the office, I, 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 re I recommend having a space where there's windows, so, you know, com something comfortable so you don't feel like you're staring at a computer screen in a dark room all day. Um, and then in terms of other space, so as I mentioned, you know, particularly for a commercial population, you know, uh, that is, I think senior, you need to, senior, we're learning this now that it, that's a less percentage virtual, but um, your need for in-office space for that physical, for the physical exam is much less. So perhaps you can plan for utilize existing, um, uh, existing office space to sort of borrow to do the, um, um, you know, for, for when patients do need to come in person. But otherwise, if you really are virtual, <clears throat> a lot of that, <clears throat> a lot of the, um, you know, exam room, clinical space needs um, really shrink. As I mentioned, maybe, maybe we'll sort of say conservatively 80%, 80 to 90%. Thank you. Um, this next one is from Lovada Hills Physicians. Um, and just, uh, let's see, we hear about connectivity issues with Epic. Have you all experienced a high level of connectivity issues and how did you resolve? Mm. Epic video, I'm assuming. Um, I will say that when we moved into Canto, it's become less of an issue. Um, we definitely had, in the early days, I had co connectivity challenges when I was doing it on the laptop. And then also when patients were doing it on a, a computer or laptop. Um, I do think that the device, even when the Wi-Fi bandwidth was the same, um, the device makes a difference. So I hope that, and so again, so if you're doing Epic video, I recommend, um, you know, the provider can be on a laptop. I do recommend that patients, um, that you do it through the mobile app. Um, it, it cuts down the need for, um, for there to be downloads and software upgrades. If they're doing that on their computer and phone, you're going to run into more technical issues that way. I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, Lovada had another question I don't believe was answered. Um, how are you able to encourage use of an app that has to be downloaded uh, where you have invested resources versus a platform that does not? Sorry, so the question is how do we... Encourage the use of an app that has to be downloaded. I, I assume it has to be downloaded by the patients. 
Yes, right, exactly. I mean, some of this is we take a system approach that, that it's easier for patients um, to download so that the burden falls off of the care team to support that. Um, but the second piece, I think, is that value proposition. So for those patients that are able to to self-serve, you know, you make it, you send them a link, you send them the code to um, get onto the my, their patient portal and then to download the app with instructions. And then you have the percentage of patients um, that need um, kind of the handholding and need the walkthrough. And they probably need an understanding of the value proposition to do so. Um, so again, I think, as I mentioned before, the great opportunity for that is there are patients who are not motivated to download the app um, until something acute happens. And so that's where we've made sure that um, they know how to reach us when they need us. And then at the time that they need, you know, acutely ha need to have a medical need to close, that's when we get them to download the app. It also helps that for other care they receive in the system, there's a, a lot of other functionality that's included in the app. So it's an additional incentive for them. Exactly. Thank you. Um, this next question from Fiona. Uh, so now that we're in a pandemic, this mode of connecting with patients will only grow. How do you see your model growing across the Sutter system and beyond? What do you think, Lynette? <laughs> uh, so certainly I think, you know, in the first year of our practice, a lot of the questions we got were um, around the virtual piece. So we were building this more global value-based model, but almost every question started with, how do you get patients to embrace virtual? So within the span of a month, those questions have disappeared. <laughs> um, and so I think there's a lot more, yeah, openness to that. We were already in the process of um, scaling, scaling and expanding the model based on the strength of our early results against the quadruple aim. Um, so that, I guess those expansion plans are continuing and I think we just, um, the sort of the level of friction we've experienced in that has, has reduced. So, um, but yeah, I guess the, the summary of that is we are um, planning, already expanding across in the Sutter system and certainly actively looking into what that could look like in a, in a bigger geographic footprint. I think if, if I were to add anything too, uh, maybe perhaps one of the rate limiters is also finding providers that are open to practicing in this new way. And so I think now we have providers who are primed and prepped. They've now started to experience virtual visits and that it's that they can, you know, it's address some of their fears about being able to provide high quality care virtually. And so um, again, um, providers that, uh, you know, are sort of more terror, terror practice ready. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so from what Tanya King, uh, I'm not sure if this is different from uh, the question by Botchwell, what device are you using for telephonic calls? Mm, yeah, so we use either Doximity or Skype um, and that's what sends out our practice number. It is really important to have a number that patients recognize, otherwise you're gonna be playing phone tag. <laughs> We still do play phone tag anyways, if you know. So again, that's a big value of having patients using um, messaging and engaging on the portal. It really cuts down on the, the infrastructure you need to support telephone callbacks. That answers your question. Yeah. Um, I think that'll be it for all the questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Taro, Annette, and Robert for answering all those. Um, I think at this point, we'll turn it over to April for some closing. Okay, great, thanks, Michael. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is just a quick plug. There's a weekly survey that the Primary Care Collaborative is fielding um, to track the impact on primary care practices. So there's a live link in the PDF that was posted earlier in the chat. Um, if you um, can encourage folks to respond to that, it's really helpful data that they're collecting. And then the next slide, um, just would like to um, launch a quick poll to get your feedback on how useful you feel the content of this webinar was. So if you could just quickly respond to that, um, we would love to get your feedback. We just wanna make sure that we're meeting the needs um, that uh, folks have right now during this really difficult time. And then as you're doing that, um, I just wanna really, again, thank you um, so much to our guests, uh, to Yumi Taylor and Lynette Fong and Rob Scrace. It was just um, 
I mean, I don't know that I've seen so many questions come through so quickly that we were all, uh, you know, frantically trying to manage it. And that's what we love, um, this really great engagement. So just so appreciate you taking the time um, and working with us to prepare such a great, um, great informative hour for us. Um, just encourage all of you to stay connected to us. Um, visit the COVID resources page. Um, email us or what we've offered to and thank you um, to the Terra team is their email addresses um, as, as follow up. So the contact information is there for you. Um, and yeah, we're going to close out the webinar now. And um, thanks to everyone for participating. Really appreciate um, the large number of, of people who joined us today and hope all of you stay well. Thank you.